Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise the Lord.
that. Our call to worship. We gather together to worship our loving, nurturing God, who, like a mother, knows us intimately, loves us unconditionally, teaches us the way that we should go, and comforts us, comforts us in times of need. Praise God, the source and sustainer of life. Who loved us before we were yet born, who knows us even better than we know ourselves, whose presence never leaves us, and whose love for us never ceases. This is our God. Let's worship together. A hymn of praise is Lift Him Up. by Sister Muriel Tucker's son. And should you feel so moved, be welcome and join the 
Brother Tucker at the altar. my might by the spirit of the living God Amen. hallelujah Hallelujah. this morning we come to lift up mothers Proverbs 31 and 11 declares but who can find a virtuous woman for her price her price is better and much higher than Ruby and then it goes on to say in verse 25, for strength and honor. <laughs> Hallelujah. Strength and honor is our clothing. Somebody needs to shout Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Strength and honor is our clothing. <laughs> My God. And she shall rejoice. in time to come. Let us pray. Father, we come this morning, my God, lifting up mothers, but praying to you, God, because you are the author and finisher of our faith. We come, God, giving you our petitions, Lord, because you and you alone can answer can redeem us, can set us free. So God, we say thank you. Thank you, oh God, for allowing your Holy Spirit to be in the midst of us this morning. God, as we gather to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, oh God, because you have protected us down through the week, but we have come on this Sunday, God, to glorify and magnify you. Hallelujah. We've come, oh God, to honor mothers. Hallelujah. We've come to give you thanks, God, for who you are, for what you have done, for what you are doing. Oh my God, for what you are about to do, oh God. So send the anointing of your Holy Spirit in this house this morning, oh God. That everything, oh God, everything, God, would be done unto you, Lord. Send your anointing, oh God, so that we might be empowered, oh God, as men and women of the gospel of Jesus and Christ. Send your anointing, oh God, upon the preach word that will go forth this morning, oh God so that it will bless the hearts of mothers who are being honored today, oh God. Send the anointing of your Holy Spirit, oh God, even on the worship lead, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus, that he may lead this congregation into worship. Send your anointing, oh God, on the musicians, oh God, as they honor you, oh God, with their talents in the name of Jesus. Send your anointing, oh God, on the technicians, oh God, on the visual, the effects, oh God. Send your anointing, oh God, on this house, Bethel, oh God, the house that cares, oh God. But more importantly, oh God, we ask for the anointing to fall on mothers this morning, oh God, because they have been special, oh God. They have been nurturing down through the ages, oh God, in the name of Jesus. God, we have so much to be thankful for for mothers. 
I even say thank you for my mother. In Jesus' name, God, why she tarried here on earth, God. She saw fifth that I would see you first, God. Seek you out and find you, oh God. And then she took her breath and gave it up to God in the name of Jesus. So we lift up all of those mothers who have gone on to glory. I pray in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus that they are got their starry crown upon their head and are being pampered by you, O oh God, because you said in your word that you went before us to prepare a place for us. And so we're thankful, hallelujah, Jesus, for all of those mothers, oh God, who have left their children behind, but they instilled into them wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, oh God, which can only come from you, God. So I pray right now in Jesus' name that every mother, hallelujah, that can hear this prayer this morning, I pray that you be blessed beyond your imagination in the name of Jesus. I pray that God will grant you every desire of your heart in the name of Jesus. So God, I thank you for how you have led mothers, oh God, to be stalwarts in our lives, oh God, to nurture us, to clothe us, and to protect us as well, oh God. Thank you for all that they do for us, oh God. So we come to the joy this morning to honor them with every fiber found within us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. We come to give you glory for them this morning. Hallelujah, we thank you, Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Father. Now, kind Father, we turn this service over to you. My God, let your Shekinah glory fill this house. Let every parishioner seated on the pews, God, let them feel the power and anointing that you are about to bestow upon them, oh God. Let them lift their voices in praise and adoration to you, God, because you are our healer. You are our provider. You are our protector. Thank you, Lord, for wrapping your loving arms around us and keeping us in a safe and sound mind. Now, kind Father, you be seated wherever you want. Let the people hear from you this morning, God. Glory to your name, Father. We give you honor. We give you praise. And we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let every heart, let every heart give God praise this morning. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Just to hear you say, Jesus, that I am your friend.
give God some praise. Please stand and let's give God some praise. Please stand and let's give God some praise. Hallelujah, he is worthy. And he is all you need. Sometimes you just want to call on his name and say thank you. Thank you for protecting you from all dangers seen and unseen. For hearing that, that cry when you're reaching out to him looking for forgiveness. When you're humbling yourself before him crying out Lord to wipe away all of those sins, transgressions and iniquities that you, you, we may have committed at any given time. So he deserves the praise church. He deserves our praise. Hallelujah. Yeah. You, you know, and, the, and, the, and it's sometimes you just have to stand and, and shout. You know, you may say, oh, it's not in my nature. I'm kind of quiet. Ah, but God is bigger than that. God is bigger than that. You know, in that moment that you were reaching out to him. Did you shed a tear? He saw it. He heard it. And he answered that prayer. That deserves a shout of praise. You know, sometimes when you're driving along and or something happens and it gets your attention and you realize that it could have been worse. You reach out and you say, sometimes it's just a whisper of thank you. But then there are other times when you shout a thank you from out of that, out of that situation. So, yes, draw us nearer. Draw us nearer. Because that's where your protection is. That's where your growth is. In that moment when you're pleading for a closer walk with him, Draw us nearer, yes. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to Our scripture this morning will be led by Sister Leslie Williams' daughter. The scripture this morning will be read from Exodus 2, 1 to 10. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she bought a piper's basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood in the distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent the, her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This was one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse him for you? Yes, go, yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, 
saying, I drew him out of the water. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to each and every one of you. A special shout out to all the mothers in the house, all the mothers in Zoom, that indeed you will be blessed today, that you will be pampered, that your family will show their appreciation for you. And we say, may God continue to bless and keep you. It is so good to see Sister Verna being in the house this morning. Amen. God bless you, sweetheart. She and her family are worshiping with us this morning. And it's our prayer that God will continue to bless you and keep you. It's our prayer this morning. Amen. Amen. The flowers that beautify our sanctuary this morning, they were given from Sister Annette Simmons. And they're in love and memory of Sister Pat Ritter. And with love at, to Brother Eric and the family, and she's asked that these beautiful flowers will go to Sister Julia Dorm. So we praise God for her this morning. Birthdays and birthdays for this week. On Tuesday, May 10th, Sister Barbara Burgess will celebrate her 87th birthday. Amen. And on Saturday the 14th, Brother Marvin Trott will celebrate his 79th birthday. To the two of you, we say happy birthday, and it's our prayer that God will continue to bless you and keep you, and may he give you many, many more. Our announcements for this week, our Commission of Stewardship and Finance will be tomorrow evening, and I'm changing that from in-person to Zoom. So we will have a Zoom Commission on Stewardship and Finance tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. Our trustees will be meeting on Thursday evening on Zoom, also at 7.30. The homegoing celebration for Sister Clark will be held on Wednesday, May the 11th at 1 o'clock p.m. The viewing will be held on Tuesday here at the church from 6.30, uh, from 6 until 7. So we are invited to come and give our respects and our support for Sister Leslie and family as we celebrate the life of Sister Clark. We'd like to say thank you to all those persons who helped in any way with the end-to-end -end walk, our water stop down at the causeway. We had a wonderful time, and that table has been dedicated in memory of Sister Ruth B. Smith as we celebrate her life, as we remember her ministry to God, as we provided uh, water, food, snacks for the walkers as they came by. Um, I think I only saw one Bethel member, that was Brother Larry. Jasmine, you didn't walk this year? Middle to end, amen, amen. But thank you to all those persons who helped in giving fruit or monetary donations and your time. We say thank you. At the back of our bulletins, you will find the list of our meetings. The missionaries, Pastor's Aid and Ladies Aid will be having their elections. And also, our quarterly conference will be held on the 19th, and that will be an in-person meeting. We're asking as many as possible if you can be present, as this will be our presiding elder's final quarterly conference. So that is on the 19th in person. We ask if you would take your bulletins, and let's make every effort to support our church. Let us now come as we prepare for our tithes and our offerings, as we give back to the Lord as he has so graciously and abundantly blessed us. As our ushers come this morning, let us give in faith unto the Lord. Our gracious and our eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity, dear God, that you provide for us, that we can give back unto you. God, we ask indeed that you will pour out your blessing on every hand and every heart.
that God we would give in accordance to faith in your word, to the faith of your promises, that God indeed you will supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. So God, we ask for your blessings in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Congratulations to Brother Sergio Griffin, who graduated with a Bachelor of Arts with a major in political science from Penn State. So we say congratulations to Sergio. May God continue to bless you. We we'll now have ministry and song by Sister Gertrude Sum Thomas's son, and will be followed by the preaching of Sister Felicia Stevens' daughter. Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day to you all. Just a little, a few uh, little um, tidbits that I put together. Um, this day was set aside to honor mothers who are deserving. Mothers have a very hard way to travel. They gotta bring up and nourish us and make us be hopefully the citizens that they would like for us to be. And it was founded in 1907 by a lady by the name of Anna Jarvis, she was the one that thought that mothers should be honored and uh, she decided to start this and it's become a, a worldwide thing. Uh, the other thing that I would like to say is, I know we, we mothers have a hard job and we try to be friends to our kids and it's nice to be complimentary to our children, but it's not a nice thing when we come, the children start telling us how to, how to be mothers. 
So I just thought I'd just throw that in. Um, I came from a long line of strong mothers. My great great granny was a very strong lady. She uh, she was the mother of my mother, and uh, that was Gertrude Thomas. Uh, I also had a, the opportunity to marry into the Hollis family. Very strong group of people. My mother-in-law was a very strong lady. My former wife, who's deceased, who was deceased, also very strong. My mother was extremely strong. She didn't, you just, she just looked at you. You knew what she was thinking when she looked at you. So it wasn't no hidden or anything like that. She just looked at you. My, uh, my present wife, who is uh, principal, former principal of a school and disciplinarian, she has two strong daughters that she is very strong in that. And uh, I've been blessed that my, my kids are very strong and well minded. So just a little excerpt of how we uh, should be real respectful to our mothers. Uh, the song that I've just, I heard it a couple of weeks ago and I decided to do it today. I hope it, you can enjoy the message. Learning to lean on Jesus, learning to love on Jesus, learning to love oh, on Jesus is the best thing that I've ever done learning to love on Jesus learning to love on Jesus learning to love on Jesus is the best thing that I could have done. When I'm with him, I feel protected. When I'm with him, never disconnected no when i'm with him i feel protected is the thing that i could have done oh no yeah. learning to love on learning to love on Jesus learning to love on Jesus is the best thing that I could have done
I'll say again, learning to love on Jesus, learning to love on Jesus, learning to lean and love on Jesus. Is the best thing that I could have done. When I'm with Him, I feel protected. When I'm with Him, never disconnected. No. When I'm with Him, I feel protected is the best thing that I could have done. I'll say again, what I ever done. I'll tell you now, oh, it's the best thing that I could have done. We'll do it again. It's the best thing that I could have done. Thank you. Thank you. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing. I beg your pardon, sir? I'm nobody's little girl. I'm Felicia's a woman, daughter. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. I'm going 21, sir. Sean, can you play 283 for me, please? It says, consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. By thy power of grace divine, let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will, my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, God. Draw me nearer, God. Father, I ask that you will consecrate me. Anoint me now, God, for this moment of preaching. That, Lord, it not be my will, but God, thy will. That, Lord, not my words, but God, your words. Have your way, Father. Speak through me, God. Put flesh aside. Let your spirit rise forth in me. That God, your people, will hear your voice. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen.
Our text was read in our hearing this morning. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I will focus on verses 8 through 10. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she bore him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she called, named him Moses, for she says, because I drew him out of the water. I'd like to preach from the title this morning, Motherly Influence. Moses was born at a time when the birth of a male meant certain death. Moses had decreed that baby boys born through Hebrew women must be thrown into the Nile. Pharaoh failed that the Hebrew people would become too strong, too powerful, too many. And his only solution was to destroy all baby boys. As we examine our text this morning, we find that the mothers of Moses, Moses, and yes, I'm talking about plural, provided a blueprint for caring for our children in this troubled present age. Like the time in which Moses was born, our sons are born into a time in which society does not view them in a positive or favorable manner. How do we as mothers, as parents, guide and protect our children as they live in a world which is hostile to their very existence? I believe that Jacobad's refusal to let the prevailing culture negatively to affect her child's development is an inspiration to any mother, to any family who struggles to inspire their children, our children to live Christ-like lives in this fallen, broken world. As we examine these two women, these two mothers of Moses, we can follow their example of how to raise productive children who will rise up and serve their community and the world at large. As we examine his birth mother and his adopted mother, we will find the qualities that will help us in our parenting today. We find that they were defiant, they were resourceful, and they were faithful. Let's take a look at their defiance. Jacobet, in order to save her newborn, we find that she refused to comply with the decree of Pharaoh. In verse three, we find that she saw that he was a goodly child and she hid him for three months. There was something special about the child that she had just given birth to. In reviewing the meaning of the word goodly, we find the words beautiful, cheerful, at ease, kindness, joyful, pleasant, and sweet. One scholar wrote that he was comely to God or divinely beautiful. It was not just an exterior beauty. There was something spiritually beautiful about this child named Moses. His beauty, his demeanor, induced his parents to do whatever was necessary to save his life. You see, they believed that he was born for a higher purpose and a higher destiny. She refused to obey the king's decree to kill, to harm, or destroy her child. Why? Because she saw something different, something special in him. Jacobet was a defender of her child because she saw the greatness in him. She was a rule breaker because she saw the potential in his future. Let's now take a look at Pharaoh's daughter, his adopted mother. Let's take a look at her defiance. 
upon, upon finding the male child hidden in the bulrushes, she realized that this child was indeed a Hebrew baby. Under the current decree of her father, this child that she now found should have been killed, thrown back into the Nile and left to die. However, we find that rather than complying with her father's decrees, she refused to follow her father's evil ways. There was something unique, something special about this Hebrew child that caused her to, to disregard the ruling of her father. Like his birth mother, his adoptive mother was soon also enticed by his beauty and saw that there was something special about this child that she would take him and care for him and adopt him as her own. We find that both women were bold enough to go against the Pharaoh's decree. Both women were defined in their resolve to protect this child. Both women saw the value, both the present and the future importance of this newborn child. In order to protect our children, we too must be like these two mothers that we must be willing to go against society, we must be willing to stand against institution, against gangs and against individuals who seek to destroy our children before they even have time to live. We must resolve that there is no institution, no government, and no gangs in our present day that will destroy our children, our sons, our daughters, nor their future. We must see who they are. We must see their potential, not just for today. We must see their future potential. We must be willing to defy. We must be willing to come against anything that seeks to destroy our children. When we see each child, we must be prepared to defend at any cost, to care for, to nurture and support our children. Be fine as we look at our text, that not only were they defined, these two women were also resourceful. Let's look at Jacobet. We find that when she could no longer care for her three-month-old, that she devised a plan of how she can preserve his life. And as we read the text, we find that she made a basket made out of bulrushes. She covered it with tar and with pitch, and she put her child in the basket and then placed the basket in the reeds near the water's edge. When I look at what she did, she used what was available to her. All she had was the bulrushes and the tar. So that lets me know it's not what you have, it's what do you do with what you have. Jacobad made a basket out of all that she had. She made it waterproof so nothing would harm her child. And then she placed her three-month-old three son into it and placed it amongst the reeds of the water's edge. When she could no longer hide him at home, she now hid him in the reeds at the water's edge. She placed him amongst the reeds for a reason, because amongst the reeds there was security. Very often we read the account and we think that she placed them right into the water, but as I did some research, she didn't put them in the water, but she placed him amongst the reeds. Why would she do that? Do that? Because you see, amongst the reeds, the reeds had deep roots. And placing the, the basket amongst the reeds, it meant that it would not be carried away nor turned over by the violence of the winds and the waters. She placed it amongst the reeds so that it can be concealed, but that it will be found quickly by some kind hand. Her putting it amongst the reeds wasn't just an arbitrary decision, but there was some wisdom, there was some reason behind her placing it amongst the reeds. If she had placed it in the water, he would have been left to the winds and the waves that were carried him and even drowned him. When she could no longer protect her child, she placed him amongst the reeds. But in doing so, she was also committing him to the providence and to the wise care of the God that she believed in. She didn't know what would happen to him once she placed him in the reeds. 
She did the best that she could, but now we're finding that she was putting her trust in God to protect and care for her child when she could no longer care for him. She protected, she prepared, and she released him. Somebody needs to hear this this morning, that when we are no longer able to protect and care for our children, we need to put them in a place where they will not be carried away by the violence of society. We need to put them in a place where they will not be destroyed, be destroyed by the storms of life. We must put them somewhere where if we can't find, if we can't help them, there's another kind hand who can help them. We must remember it takes a village to raise a child. There are so many kind hands out there who are willing to help and care for your child when you're no longer able to meet the needs. Jacobag committed her child to the providence and to the care of God. And we too must do the same thing. Mamas, we must learn to take our hands off and put our children in God's hands and let God do what only God can do. We see that Jacobad was resourceful. She went and made a basket from scratch and lined it that it was waterproof. But the best thing that she did was to let go and let God. The best place for her child was no longer in her house, but the best place for her child was in the hands of God, was in the wisdom of God was now in the providence of God. Jacobad was a resourceful mother. Let's now take a look at the resources of Pharaoh's daughter. And I did some searching and nowhere could I find her name. But we need to understand her name is not important. And when we look at what she did for this child that was not of her womb, that was not of her race, we see a woman with a compassionate and loving heart. Jacobet, once Pharaoh's daughter found the child, she realized it was a Hebrew child. And she called for a mother to come and nurse. And his sister and all her young wisdom went and got mama. And Jacobet was paid to nurse her own child. She was paid to do what she would have done for nothing. But look how God was able to intervene and make that arrangement happen. Pharaoh's daughter now finding a surrogate mother to nurse her newly found child, but now pay for the mother to nurse Moses. Pharaoh's daughter, we find, had the resources, the financial resources available to pay his mother. But I want us to know and understand this morning that her resources goes far beyond her finances. That when we look at her story, when we understand who she is, forget about the fact that she was an Egyptian and the Egyptians hated the, Israel, the children of Israel. When we look at this woman of compassion, I find that she was a woman of great influence. We find in verse 10 that it says, the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. We saw that contrary to the king's command, she took pity on Moses, then rather than having him die, she chose to let the male child live. But this wasn't just any child. He was a Hebrew child. He was considered a sworn enemy of the state. Pharaoh's daughter was taking a tremendous risk in taking this Hebrew child back to the palace. So why does she do it? Why couldn't she just adopt an orphan Egyptian boy? Why, when she took him back to the palace, why did Pharaoh allow her to keep this child going against the wise counsel of his committee, against his own decree? 
By allowing his daughter to keep this child, he was nullifying his own decree, going against the council, going against his own decree. But the only way she was allowed to adopt Moses as her child, she had to get the consent of Pharaoh, her father. And I, it is here that I believe that she was a woman of influence and timing. You see, stay with me for a moment. I believe she used the time that she gave Moses back to Jacobeb and told her take him home and nurse him to the time that Jacobeb would return him back to the palace as the prince of Egypt, that she would use this time period to convince her father to allow Moses to become her son. She used this time to her advantage to influence him to accept Moses as her son and as the prince of Egypt. We know that she succeeded. The text doesn't say how long before Moses came back, but the text revealed that he grew and he was returned to the palace. It was only, I believe, because of her influence over her father, the Pharaoh, that now Moses was living in the palace. Upon his entrance into the palace, we find that his life would forever change. He would now be the recipient of an Egyptian education. He was instructed in all the wisdoms of the Egyptian people. And I make the distinction in his education because yes, while in the palace, he received an Egyptian's education, but while he was yet home with his birth mother, he too was educated in the ways of God and the, and the history of the Hebrew people. Moses was well educated by his birth mother and his adoptive mother. He was taught the things of Egypt, and the things of God. But as we know the story of Moses, we know that later on in his life that he would choose the things of God over the things of Egypt. So it's whose education had the most importance in his life. In raising our children in this present difficult age, we must use all the resources that are available to us. We must use our influence and our timing to accomplish the goals to protect and preserve our children. We must value the power of an education. We must teach them our history, our legacy, and more importantly, we must teach them about our God. The mothers of Pharaoh, of Moses, they were influential in his life, teaching him the things that he needed to know, not only as dwelling in the palace, but also walking with his God. These women were resourceful women. And finally, let's look at being faithful. And as I was going through, finding Jacobet's faithfulness was easy. By faith, Moses, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. That's found in Hebrews 11 and 23. And 23. Moses' parents acted in faith. Their faith eliminated any fear of what the king may do. They had faith over fear. As we look and examine their lives, we see that their faith shaped the lives of Moses. He owed his life to their faith. Without their faith, he would have died in the Nile on the day that he was born. Without their faith, he would have been given, he would have only been given an Egyptian education. But because of their faith, while he was yet still living with them, they taught him the things of God. We need to know and understand that it's our faith in God that shapes 
the lives of our children. We come this morning to let you know that we must remain faithful, that we must be faithful even in this difficult and trying times. It is our faith that will bring us through. It is our faith that will teach our children how to walk and talk with God. It was the faith of his parents that Moses became the man of God that he was. I tried to find of how I can fit Moses' daughter into the faith category. But unfortunately, there's no story, there's no account, there's no details about her being faithful. But what stood out to me was the effects of Moses' parents and their faith on him. You see, when we read verse 23, that talks about the faith of Moses. That's in Hebrews 11 and 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid for three months by his parents. They saw that he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So see that verse 23 talks about their faith. But you know, there comes a time when the faith of your parents must now become your own faith. And it's there in verses 24 to 28 that we see the faith that they instilled in Moses was no longer mama's faith, but it was now his faith. Amen. Read with me, by faith, Moses, when he was grown, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share in ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sins. He considered abuse suffered for the court for Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he, Moses, kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. When we look at verses 24 to 28, we find that the faith of his mother, the faith of his father now became his faith. Moses embraced the faith that his parents had taught him. You see, they only had him for a short while. While mama nursed him, she seized every opportunity to make sure she would give him something that would help in his development. She gave him knowledge of God. At some point in his life, Moses developed his own faith. Moses acquired his own faith, his own relationship with God but it was the faith of his mother and father that showed him the way. As we come today to celebrate Mother's Day, I ask you the question, what does your faith like, look like? And your children, do they walk after your faith? Have they found their own faith? Or are they still clinging to the faith of mama and daddy? We must teach them the things of God so they can have their own faith their own relationship with God. Through the lives of Jacobab and his adopted mother, we see the influence of mothers. Both were bold by refusing to obey the king's decree. Can you imagine? This could have meant certain death for either one of them if Pharaoh found out that she had a child three months old. Not only would the child have been killed, but the entire family would have been killed. Even Pharaoh's daughter would have stood the chance, would not have stood a chance because she too could have been killed. But they had the boldness, the audacity to defy even the king's edict. We find that Jacob teaches us to be flexible, to be creative in difficult times. Yes, we're living in hard times. Each week there's another death, there's another stabbing, there's another shooting. But we must learn how to be creative to find the answers that will protect our children. 
We must learn how to seek God's face to find what we need to do to preserve the lives of our young men and our young women. We must be flexible and creative. We can stay stiff necked always. There is a generation that God is calling. Jacobin reminds us not to lose faith that God will work in the lives of our children. We must trust that believe that God will make a way somehow. We must continue to trust in him. Pharaoh's daughter, she teaches us the compassion of a child not born of your womb and not even of our ethnic race. How many of us would love our own, but we question it. I, but we must be willing to love even those who don't look like us. A child is a child. And Pharaoh's daughter shows us that in spite of who her father was, in spite of his vengeance on the children of Israel, that she had a compassionate heart to love and care for a child that was not hers, not born of her womb. In this account, I'm so glad that we can find that God will raise up a friend for you to step in, to help you. He would even find a friend amongst your enemies. You see, Pharaoh cruelly sought out Israel's destruction. But look at who God used to preserve and to keep the children of Israel. It was his own daughter that with a compassionate heart reached out to help Moses. That yes, it even went beyond her initial intent. That there are some writers that say that it was because of her that Israel, that she preserved Israel's deliverer. Imagine, see what God can do? See how God can use mothers? The Egyptians sought to destroy the children of Israel. But I'm so glad that God is able to use two mothers, one biological, born of her womb, and the other one born of her heart. These women, they saw the potential in Moses. They saw that he was no ordinary child. They set out to protect, they set out to release, because both mothers had to release him at some point to do what God would have them to do. This lets me know our children are not our children, but they belong to God. We must learn how to release. We must learn how to love them and yet still release them. We like these women must learn how to be defiant, to stand in the face that will try to destroy our children. We must use our resources to do whatever it takes to ensure that our children live. The influence of mothers. Like Jacob, we must be faithful to God and God will make a way. Our gracious and our eternal God, we thank you this morning, God, for your word, for these two women of faith, that God, they were able to trust you, that God, they were able, God, to love Moses, God, one from the womb and one from the heart. So God, teach us to be like these mothers, that God, we are defined when needed, that God, we are resourceful when needed, and God, we would always be faithful unto you. So God, have your way in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. If there's one, today oh for faith it's through these two women that we find a blueprint of how we can walk through these troubled times living in a society where death is commonplace, where our children are being destroyed. We have the blueprint from these two mothers 
to love those born of our womb and to love those born of our heart. So that lets me know there ought to be no child left out that we must love and care for every child. Oppressed by every foe. Is there one this morning that desires prayer, that desires salvation? To get to know this God that so moves in our lives that he takes us from the cradle, that he forms us while even yet in our mother's womb, that he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for you. If there's one, Father, we thank you. Father, we ask that you will continue to speak to hearts and minds. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. We've come. We've worshipped. And now it's time to leave and share the good news of Jesus with everyone that we meet. Our the doxology and the benediction. I'll do benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore, let every heart say, Amen. Till, till
Have a blessed Mother's Day and have a great week with thee, great God. Lift up your hands as our closing hymn.